Prachi Bhardwaj, the associate editor with the EBC Publishing Private Limited. And mm -hmm. today mm -hmm. we will be discussing the important topic on IPR and the access to vaccines in a public health crisis like the one that we are going through right now. And to discuss this, this topic, we will be joined by uh, Mr. Shantanu Mukherjee, who is the founder of Ronin Legal, a boutique corporate law firm that focuses on pharma and healthcare. So he is also a regular contributor to the SEC online blog and is writing a series of articles on how the VAX was won. You can check out all his articles on the SEC online blog. You will find the link in the bio. So let's invite Mr. Shantanu Mukherjee. Hi, Prachi. Hi, Shantanu. How are you? Hey, very well. Good to see you. Thank you for What's joining us. You're most Thank welcome. Thank you for doing pleasure. this with us. You're most welcome. I am I'm looking forward Let's to Let's start it. with the session. Absolutely. Okay, so as we all know, it's 1st of May. And from today onwards, uh, everybody who is 18 above is now eligible for vaccination for COVID-19. It is a great news for everybody, except for the fact that there are not enough vaccines. So, and I was also reading that uh, only six states will actually be going forward with this vaccination drive and that too, not in all the districts. So let's start with this, like, how did we reach here even after one year of the, uh, since the pandemic broke out, we still do not have enough vaccines. What actually went wrong? Right. Right. No, that's an excellent question, Prachi. Uh, you know, it, it really makes you wonder, right? I mean, this isn't like uh, the um, the pandemic didn't break yesterday. We've had this for a while. So why don't we have enough vaccines, you ask? And the reason is because we don't have enough manufacturers. Uh, why don't we have enough manufacturers? Why doesn't anyone that has, uh, you know, the capacity to manufacture vaccines uh, not manufacturing vaccines, right? As you see with, say, oxygen. Right. Anyone that has the capacity to manufacture oxygen is trying to do so right now. Right. Why isn't it the same with vaccines? Because of, well, many reasons, I guess, as we've talked earlier, and as I've discussed on my um, in my articles, it's complicated. But one but many would say that one of the main reasons is uh, the monopolistic regime. Uh, provided by, um, you know, intellectual property rights, right? And uh, this, again, is a nuanced uh, argument. It's not black and white. So let me take a minute to go through it. Um, the vaccines uh, that were invented, they had to be invented to deal with this uh, particular virus, um, even though, uh, even though uh, you know, uh, many of the patents uh, that uh, existed um, uh, you know, in connection with uh, medicines that have been uh, developed for SARS um, and Ebola, some of those patents could be repurposed, were repurposed for uh, this. But essentially, as uh, uh, you all know, being students of intellectual property rights, uh, once you've made an invention, you are eligible to patent it. And the patent is essentially a monopoly, right? Uh, this effectively means that no one else can manufacture uh, that particular product. Now, uh, that, just, that, that just seems fair in, in the ordinary course of things. But in a situation like this, when the exercise of your, uh, monopoly, uh, uh, your, your monopolistic rights is effectively uh, standing in the way of um, you know, uh, uh, getting access to medicines to the entire world, one needs to start. Uh, many people have uh, been questioning um, you know, what can be done, right? So there's a hearing right now, as you know, in the Supreme Court, where uh, one of the, where the petitioners have asked that compulsory licensing uh, be right. granted, uh, right? So that's one of the solutions that is being um, bandied about, um, which, uh, so, so we need to, uh, I think, uh, pause for a minute uh, here and uh, think about uh, whether compulsory licensing uh, uh, will, is, is actually a solution, right? Now, uh, as all of you know, being students of IP, um, uh, compulsory licensing is essentially, um, you know, when the government um, 
mm, expropriates, intellectual property rights, they essentially say that, uh, look, I'm granting, a, uh, you've disclosed the patent. Uh, I'm granting, um, I'm, I'm, I'm allowing uh, XYZ uh, to be a licensee uh, to work the patent, right? Because I believe that you haven't made the subject of the patent available within the territory, right? And this is because philosophically, what's the philosophical basis for a compulsory license, right? The philosophical basis is that a monopoly is granted by the state via a patent with the understanding that the patent will pass into the public we um, will pass into the uh, you know the public realm and uh, be available for the good of the public. Uh, it's it's a quid pro quo in a, in a sense, right? So when the when when the state believes that the quid pro quo is not being met from the other side, then it can um, uh, say, well, I don't see you meeting a quid pro quo, so I am going to go ahead and disclose the pattern that you disclosed to me uh, to somebody else, and he's going to work it. Right, so compulsory licensing, of course, is far more uh, is, is 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 has not been has not been used as often as you would imagine, uh, largely because um, innovator uh, pharmaceutical companies, for good reason, uh, uh, you know, the view it as uh, dangerous. It's essentially an exception to the it's an exception to the IPR regime, and uh, any exception. Um, you know, to the holder of a patent is potentially dangerous, right? Who defines when an exception is um, invoked? Uh, it's a slippery slope, right? As they keep saying. So without going into a value judgment as to uh, whether, uh, you know, innovative pharmaceutical companies are uh, justified in uh, pushing back against compulsory licensing, the fact is that they do. And very often they do. They do so not only in in in, in direct ways uh, by um, you know bringing suit against uh, uh, the companies that are working the patent, but also and against the government, but also through pressure at the trips level, right? Um, their home countries will often exert pressure through bilateral um, you know whatever bilateral investment treaties they have with the country that has granted the patent. There'll be pressure. There'll be talk about bringing an action at the trips level and things like that. And this has happened against kind of countries like India, um, Colombia, Thailand. Um, I think tried to issue a, a compulsory license uh, um, and uh, ran into hot. So these things happen, right? Now, why do they happen? Uh, why does the government step in uh, to 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 sort of uh, on a matter of international trade to support uh, mm, uh, you know, uh, pharmaceutical companies, because pharmaceutical companies are a large part of the gross domestic product of certain countries, right? Innovative pharmaceutical companies are um, key to the economy of many countries, right? Uh, they are, they're powerful, they're powerful, they have powerful lobbying groups, right? They, 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 make, campaign, they make campaign contributions um, to political parties, all of which, uh, all of which is perfectly okay, right? Or th this is just the way, this is just the way this is But is it justified during this pandemic? That is the question, because if we see that only 1.9% of Indian population has been fully vaccinated as of 29th of April, and the world population, if we talk about, it's just 3.9% and fully vaccination, because that is the only thing that will save us, not a single dose. So can the government not step in now and say that, look, this is not done because we are in the middle of a pandemic and there is a shortage of vaccines. So is the vaccine monopoly still justified? Absolutely. I mean, look, um, the I think uh, the supply crunch was predictable. Uh, people uh, should have known well in advance that uh, the, there are only two people who have been licensed to manufacture, uh, who, who are manufacturing vaccines uh, in the country, and between the two of them, their capacity is only about 65 to 70 million, uh, you know, doses uh, a, a month, and uh, that's simply not enough uh, to vaccinate people. I think I read, um, you know, the newspapers report that if we continue at our current pace of vaccination of 2.5 uh, million doses, um, I think a day, then we'll only vaccinate, I think, 30 percent of our population by the end of the year. Meanwhile, people are dying at the rate of 3,000, 3,500, 4,000 people a day, right? So people have to stop thinking of this as statistics. 
and just um, I think step in. You know, uh, people that have the power to do so should step in and allow more companies to manufacture these vaccines. Now, this of course is easier said than done because the technology transfer itself takes months, right? Add to that the complication that Serum Institute is itself a contract manufacturer for AstraZeneca. So you see that the Serum Institute doesn't own the patents. So, um, so now you have to negotiate with AstraZeneca either, either negotiate with AstraZeneca and get them to grant licenses to more my vaccine manufacturers because there are more vaccine manufacturers in India. It's not like there aren't, right? Um, uh, we, uh, uh, oh. Your connection got broken in the middle. Can you repeat your last sentence? Sorry, uh, which, which was the bit that you missed? The last sentence, the Serum Institute one. Right. I was just saying that the Serum Institute is itself a contract manufacturer in the sense that uh, it has been granted a license by AstraZeneca to manufacture the drug. And um, so, um, and I would doubt that it has the ability to, con uh, to sub-license, right? So, uh, so then the government has to negotiate with AstraZeneca and get them to grant more licenses to scale up manufacturing. Uh, Serum Institute, uh, or, and of course, uh, with Bharat Biotech, the current capacity is only between six to 15 million doses a month, I think. So they're talking about expand, they're talking about doubling capacity, but these things again take time. And even after they have doubled capacity, remember that vaccines are biological products. So a single batch can take up to, uh, uh, you know, 60 days uh, uh, so to sort of come off the line. So you double your capacity and then you start manufacturing, the vaccine comes off the comes off the line only, uh, you know, a month, two months uh, from now. And the yield, again, the problem with biological products is the yield varies. It's not like uh, regular capsules or tablets where you know how many are going to come off the assembly line. With vaccines, you don't know what the yield from a certain bioreactor is going to be. So it's complicated, which is why uh, I, this should all have been thought through well in advance, right? For example, um, uh, look, there are multiple levels of uh, complications here, right? Uh, the Serum Institute only got the license to manufacture Covishield in India as part of uh, the COVAX, in, uh, as part of the COVAX initiative, right? Which is essentially an NGO. Um, that's uh, funded by uh, Bill Gates, which is looking to increase access to medicines in the third world, in the developing countries, which is a laudable objective, but, uh, uh, but, but, but they, simply, they simply didn't license the relevant drugs, uh, the relevant vaccines out, the IP out to enough manufacturers, right? Uh, now, Serum Institute, therefore, has to produce enough to supply not only to India, but also to 90 other countries that it is uh, obliged to supply to under the COVAX initiative, right? There simply okay. isn't enough supply. So they're talking about increasing uh, manufacturing capacity now, but it's going to be months before we see the vaccines. And this is why this should all have been thought through in advance. And to address one of your earlier questions, um, you know, directly, uh, this, is, this is in fact the role um, uh, um, you know, of, 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 of governments, of authorities, um, you know, people in power uh, to, to, to manage. Uh, okay, there's a reason why for 70 years vaccination has been handled by the government, right? You, you don't leave things like vaccination uh, to to uh, you know to the private to the private sector to the to the free market right you don't leave it to uh, supply and demand and normal economic uh, sort of drivers because there is because the normal the way capitalism normally works it's not geared towards equity and in a pandemic like this um, uh, you none of us are safe until all of us are safe therefore the the focus of any vaccination effort has to be to vaccinate as many people as possible. And that's simply not gonna happen if you leave it to the private market. And that's why for 70, 73 years in India, the government has always directed vaccination efforts, which is, and, 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 and that's why there was such an outcry when, um, uh, when you know, uh, pricing, the press release came out uh, a couple of weeks ago when government left pricing to, uh, to the private players um, and uh, said that the states should procure their own vaccines. The reason there was an outcry is because it's unprecedented, not only in India, in the history of India, but also globally. No other country has left it, uh, uh, you know, to the to, 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 to market forces, right? Uh, because it simply doesn't work. 
that's why we are where we are today. Uh, one, because we didn't think far enough ahead, right? The companies uh, should, at the time uh, that they took the license, they should have thought about realistically what their ability to supply would have been. The, the NGOs, uh, COVAX and the others, should have looked more closely at how many licenses they needed to grant in order to achieve their vaccination objectives. Governments should have, uh, uh, well, I mean, uh, uh, many governments have taken a very active role, and we'll talk about the U.S., uh, you know, in, in probably another session, because I'm not sure we have enough time, but uh, governments, you know, this is, this is as you rightly said, uh, this is what governments are there for, right? Governments are meant to step in and uh, ensure uh, that processes like this run smoothly. Um, and, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not sure that happened this time around. You talked about pricing, and you said that uh, governments never leave it to the private companies to uh, things like this. Now, I saw one of the other Punawala's tweet the other day where he said that he has now, uh, they have uh, reduced the price for the Covishield vaccine to 300 rupees only. Now, this only is only for him and probably for like, people like me and you, but there are people who do not afford, uh, who cannot afford 300 rupees too. So how is it that a person who does not have 300 rupees in his pocket, his right to life becomes lesser than someone else's who has this amount? So the governments cannot now step in and put a cap on the pricing. And this cap should not be too high. That is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it's not right. really at least a minimum, a very limited amount. Vaccination should be free. Right. It's because we are talking about life here. Right. And that's that's it'll be interesting right. to see what the Supreme Court has to say. But this we're talking about the right to life. We're talking about Article 21 here. Right. Vaccination must be free. This is especially in the middle of the largest uh, health crisis in recent memory. You can't uh, 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 sort of, you know, uh, leave it. Uh, to market forces, you can't say that, uh, look, uh, 400 sounds about right, uh, you know, the states should be able to procure it for 400. Uh, the center, um, uh, you know, should negotiate. This is, what's, this is what uh, has been argued before the Supreme Court, that the center should, as it has for all these years, uh, negotiate prices. And generally speaking, you can negotiate better prices when you're buying in bulk. Right. You also you have the negotiating power, you have the leverage. So, so 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 the best way of doing it is to negotiate in bulk for the whole country and then use the machinery of the state that already exists. That Your connection is breaking. Sorry about that, Prachi. Uh, which part did you lose? That the government has the power and the leverage so after that. Yeah. Yeah, so I, so I was saying that uh, you know you can you 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 can you can uh, procure better prices if you uh, purchase in bulk, and uh, you know if you're dealing with only one party, right? So in the sense that uh, in the sense that um, uh, if, if if Serum Institute and uh, Bharat Biotech are allowed to negotiate with multiple parties, um, uh, then those parties do not have the sort of negotiating position uh, that, say, the center would have if the center simply purchased all of the vaccines and distributed them, right? So th that's the point I was making, that uh, that uh, the, center, the center has certain uh, sort of, uh, ha loses its volunteer, is giving up on the leverage because individual states don't have the same degree of leverage. Although I did see that Maharashtra has managed to get three lakh doses uh, from right. Serum Institute today. Okay. Anyway. So, mm. yeah. So it's 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 complicated, but I think um, you know uh, at its heart, um, it, you know my my view is that the intellectual property regime exists for a very good reason, and uh, there's no reason to undermine it. But this is an unprecedented uh, public health crisis, and uh, if there was ever a time to make exceptions to that regime. Uh, or uh, alternatively, for those who hold the patents to voluntarily license 
those patterns to as many people as possible, uh, right? Uh, then th 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 this is the time, right? Uh, compulsory licensing. Another thing I should have said earlier: compulsory licensing uh, doesn't isn't always uh, isn't always viable because when it comes to vaccines, which are biological products, uh, the patent may not by itself disclose. Uh, the best way of making the product. Those are often protected as uh, trade secrets, and uh, mm -hmm. the government of a country, uh, the government of a country, may not um, sort of uh, uh, be able to compel the holder of the trade secrets to disclose those trade secrets in the way, in the same way that it can disclose a patent, in the same way that it can grant a compulsory license under the patent. Right. So um, really, it comes down to intellectual property being waived at a global level, which is what uh, uh, India and South Africa have moved a petition for at the TRIPS, right? right. Uh, uh, the idea is to uh, have a temporary waiver of IPR um, such uh, that other companies that have vaccine manufacturing capacity can use the patent. Quickly, so, can you explain to our viewers what exactly this TRIPS agreement talks about and how this waiver will help, if it will at all? Yes, the TRIPS is basically just a multilateral, it's just a platform, a multilateral treaty for uh, harmonizing um, uh, intellectual property legislation across the world, right? Um, again, this goes back to what I was saying earlier. There are countries that have an interest in, that certain countries have a stronger interest in promoting intellectual property rights than other countries, right? Countries that have uh, industries that constitute a large part of the GDP that rely on IP have a great interest in making sure that other parts of the world respect IP to the same extent, because would you take the time to create uh, a movie if uh, you knew that it would be available in pirated form tomorrow, right? So, so, so that is understandable, right? Uh, the trouble is, you see, this isn't the first time that we've seen such criticism of intellectual property in the context of a public health crisis. This happened in the context of the AIDS crisis in 1997, right? And at that time, uh, at that time, after the AIDS crisis, um, uh, uh, the Doha Declaration, which essentially carved out certain uh, um, uh, exceptions to the TRIPS framework and said essentially that, uh, you know, countries can undertake certain measures such as compulsory licensing to deal with public health emergencies, right? That would, before that, uh, the, 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 the leeway that we're talking about didn't exist. Right. So uh, so that's trips. And there is a history of uh, trips exceptions being granted in public health emergencies. And uh, that's what India and South Africa uh, are pushing for right now. It has been opposed uh, by several countries at this point of time um, on the argument that the Doha Declaration already allows you certain exceptions, such as compulsory licensing, uh, in the context of a public health emergency. Why don't you use those? But of course, as we've discussed earlier, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the compulsory licensing simply doesn't work. It's an illusory right uh, to a certain extent. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, to, 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 to summarize, what can we do, right? Uh, Prashi, I think um, right now, um, to the extent that we're talking about legal measures, uh, what can be done? Uh, the answer clearly is uh, uh, to increase uh, supply. And uh, despite the ongoing efforts by Serum Institute and Bharat Biotech to increase their capacity, that may not be enough. Uh, so I think, uh, and, and that's what's being argued in the Supreme Court right now, uh, that, you know, um, compulsory licenses should be granted, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not even saying compulsory licenses are the way uh, out of this, uh, but the patent holders uh, should grant voluntary licenses, at least to other manufacturers. Uh, it'll take time for the tech transfer to be completed. It'll take time for, um, you know, uh, vaccines to start uh, rolling off the assembly line, but uh, of the bioreactor rather. Uh, but at least, uh, you know, we then have something to look forward to, you know, four months down the line. We know that we have planned for X number of vaccines to hit the market, whereas right now it seems very much like we're just hoping, right? This just seems, uh, I mean, I'm not sure uh, there is a, there's, a, uh, there's a plan, there's, uh, you know, a sort of a supply chain worked out. 
so I think I think one way or the other, we have to increase the number of manufacturers. We have to figure out the supply chain. We have to focus on the supply chain. And we can talk at another time about how well the U.S. did this by invoking a wartime legislation called DARPA. Um, uh, and, and they focused on the right thing. They focused on supply chain at the very beginning, right? And I think a lot of people... Uh, you know, ignore the role of intellectual property at the heart of all of this. People can't just go out and start manufacturing vaccines. They need the, uh, they need a license to do so. Um, now I understand Johnson and Johnson has uh, given a license to manufacture its vaccine uh, to Biological E, and um, you know, um, Bharat Biotech. The government has asked Bharat Biotech to give a license to the Hafkin Institute. Uh, but again, this is unfortunately all of this is happening. Uh, very, very late in the game. Uh, uh, vaccine, vaccine manufacturing is a complicated process. It's a complicated process. This should have all been thought through well in advance. I don't think anyone quite understands that it takes you know, 30 to 60 months for a batch to uh, yield results. And uh, it's almost unforgivable that no one did the math and figured out that, look, this is the vaccine between, it's a duopoly, right? Today, we're effectively talking about a duopoly. There are two people who control the vaccine supply in a country of 1.35 billion people. And what is their vaccine capacity put together? 70 million, maybe. And let's not forget, as we said earlier, that Serum Institute only has, uh, only has uh, uh, the right to manufacture because uh, it is part of the COVAX initiative. And under the COVAX initiative, it has the obligation to supply to other countries as well. So even if it churns out 70 vaccines, in a, uh, 70 million vaccines in a month, how many of those vaccines are, gonna, are, are they obligated to supply to other countries under the terms of their supply agreement with COVAX, right? How many, how many, how many uh, vaccines then are left for India? So this was the complication that happened early on. If you, um, you know, we all uh, remember how a few months ago we were taking credit um, for uh, exporting vaccines to various countries. Uh, I suspect we haven't seen the agreement uh, between Serum Institute and COVAX, but I suspect that was under the terms of uh, the COVAX supply agreement that we were supplying those vaccines. And then suddenly, I think. Uh, far too late, uh, I think uh, people understood that uh, we need more vaccines to be reserved for India. That, of course, put Serum Institute in a difficult position because then they were in breach of their obligations under the COVAX initiative, oh, the COVAX oh. agreement, right? So all of this would probably have been avoided if people had just understood pharmaceutical supply chain or biologic supply chain better, if people had understood, uh, you know, and, and, I, and I, yeah, if people had just understood how important it is to, uh, 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 you know, put in place effective licensing arrangements, uh, better. If there had been, uh, if there had been a global consensus early on that the classic capitalist model, uh, the classic monopoly-centric IP model, which works great most of the time, it promotes innovation, it promotes. Uh, uh, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, quick, it, it, it promotes, it, it incentivizes people uh, to get product to market fast uh, and all of that. But in an environment, in, in, in a situation like this, uh, it does not work. Because uh, in a situation like this, you have to uh, put personal profit aside and uh, work for a larger goal. Uh, international pharmaceutical companies have also been criticized in the context not only of this public health crisis, but previous public health uh, crises like uh, like AIDS, we talked about AIDS, but also Ebola, many other uh, public health emergencies like this one. They have been criticized in the past. Uh, we've seen some good come out of uh, that criticism, such as the Doha Declaration, which we spoke about earlier. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, something good, something will be done quickly. Um, it's already far too late for you know, the three lakh people uh, and their families that have already passed away. But what we can do uh, is to move uh, very, very quickly, fix the supply chain, grant more licenses and uh, take a realistic stock of the situation. Uh, we need to have central procurement. We need to have, we need to utilize the vaccine distribution uh, a, a system that exists in this country. India does vaccinations very, very well. 
right? You and I are uh, are alive uh, because uh, you know we were able to conquer polio, um, and and, uh, and uh, you know it's, it, the the mechanism exists, but people haven't thought the supply chain through. People haven't understood how much more complicated biological products are. Um, there's still we we need to. There isn't a lot of time left at this rate. Uh, you know. Uh, at this rate, um, you know, it's just burning through the population. And if we don't get our act together, I think in the next uh, few weeks, um, then, you know, it's just, we may see, it may be another three lakh deaths before uh, we finally see a meaningful uptake in the vaccination drive. How are we doing on time, uh, Prashi? I'm you. sorry. Just, yeah, hmm? it's fine. And thank you so much, Shantanu. It was very insightful, everything that you told about the vaccination and how the government needs to step in now if it wants to save its people. And uh, it's thank you. And everybody who wants to read his articles, they are all up on the SEC online blog. You will find the link on the channel. And uh, stay safe, everybody. Thank you, Shantanu, again. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thanks, Patsy. Bye. Bye.